that is, am I dead? A case of Cotard syndrome in a woman with subclinical hypothyroidism. So to discuss and uh, to present and discuss this case, so we have a team of experts um, consisting of Dr. Sharin Kaur, our trainee psychiatrist, Dr. Shalisa Vindisari, our very own clinical psychologist, um, Dr. Lau Chi Kun, endocrinologist from the Department of Medicine, Internal Medicine, and of course, um, our very own biological um, expert in biological psychiatry, that is Associate Professor Datin Sri, Dr. Suryati Mohammad Saini. So we're going to uh, present and discuss this case in that sequence yeah, the, that I have introduced. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Sherin Ko to first present the case. Thank you. Thank you for the lovely introduction, Prof. Nick. Good morning to all esteemed consultants, specialists, colleagues, and students. Thank you for joining us today on this lovely Wednesday morning for our Grand Clinical Pathological Conference. My name is Dr. Shireen, and I'll kick off today's session with a case presentation. The patient we'll, dis we'll be discussing today is Madam S. She's a 44-year-old Malay lady. She's married with three children and works as a staff at a publishing and printing company. She was actually brought in to the hospital by her husband, who noted that Madam S. had a change in behavior, verbal aggression, and irritability, which started two weeks prior to admission, and it was gradually worsening. So essentially what had happened was that two weeks prior to admission, she had a change in her workplace and there was an increase in her workload. So she had to commute for a longer distance and um, the role that she was uh, originally um, given um, was now uh, had extra responsibilities and she kind of was doing work for two to three people. And because of that, she started experiencing low mood and was eating less than usual. She was unable to sleep throughout the night despite feeling tired from work. So she was having difficulty initiating sleep, had intermittent awakening and early morning awakening. So she would be walking around the house at this time, at least that's what the husband had noted. So despite being tired, after commuting for a long hour, she just could not sleep at all. She was worried about her roles and responsibilities that she had to do the next day as she was unfamiliar with it and was actually getting reprimanded quite often by her boss. At that point, she had no self-harm behavior or no suicidality. She started missing her medication, levothyroxine, for her thyroid issue due to exhaustion and generally she's always had an issue with medication compliance. Her change in behavior was particularly noticeable on the 19th of June during her son's sports day. So on that day, patient was quieter than usual and had minimal interaction and communication with others. So usually, although being a quiet person, she's actually quite friendly and she'd be speaking to her son's friends. But on the sports day, she actually kept to herself, did not speak much to her son's friends, the son's friend's parents, not really interacting with anyone. When she came home, she started speaking about Shurga and Naraka with regards to her colleagues and she shared it with her husband. She was telling her husband about her colleagues and where they'd be placed in the afterlife. And she'll actually be talking about it to herself as well. Her husband noted that in the room she'll just be mumbling or talking to herself about how certain colleagues were not very good or some colleagues were very nice, how they'd end up in either a good place or a bad place based on how they've been treating her. She was also noted to be more irritable towards the children and was getting verbally abusive, which was not normal for her. She's a very soft-spoken and polite lady. She was gradually unable to perform house chores and even unable to go to work. She neglected her self-hygiene and was urinating at inappropriate places in the house. So the husband actually had to put her on adult diapers because she just 
was somehow not making it to the bathroom to urinate or to pass motion. At a certain point, her husband was unable to manage her and was concerned that she was she might get eventually become physically aggressive in view of her verbal aggression towards the children and the way that she was speaking ill about her colleagues. With regards to the symptoms she was experiencing, so she did ex exhibit hallucinatory behavior. She was talking to herself and even when brought to the hospital, she was saying things like bomb akan meletup, semua akan mati with regards to the patients in the hospital. And she suddenly was telling everybody to duduk di tempat masing-masing or to sit in their own places. She was having auditory hallucination. Um, it was a single voice, commanding in nature, telling her to do or not do certain things. She described it not to be malevolent because it tells her not to urinate until she could reach the bathroom. She had delusion of reference as well. She actually said that she stopped watching television or does not feel comfortable watching the television as she feels that the people on the television are speaking about her. She feels that there is an external force exerting control over her body movements, but she's unsure who or what. And this is why she's probably unable to make it to the bathroom and unsure of what to do. Um, and her actions may not seem normal. She was experiencing thought alienation in the form of thought insertion thought withdrawal and thought broadcasting. She felt that something or someone was able to put thoughts in her mind and that her thoughts can be read actually by everyone else. She is actually aware that she's been forgetful. So this is what she meant by uh, thought withdrawal by saying that the external force is the one withdrawing her thoughts from her mind, making her forgetful. She felt that this delusion of reference um, she was aware that she felt that people on the TV were talking about her. She felt that it was something or someone um, actually putting these thoughts into her mind. She was having finger agnosia as well, which means the inability to recognize her own fingers. She was having fluctuation of cognition. She actually forgot at times whether she was married or not, who her children were, how many children she had, and actually unable to recall basic recipes that she used to cook at home. So she's actually a pretty good cook, uh, described previously by her husband, but she just somehow couldn't remember any of the recipes um, that she's used to cooking on a daily basis, very basic things like nasi goreng or fried rice. So if asked about um, steps to cook, she'll actually start off um, by stating the ingredients, and she would actually just zone out and say that she'll just eat whatever's there prepared. She's also unsure about using the amenities in the washroom for self-care. So when she goes into the washroom, she'll actually sort of pause for a while because she would not know what to do in the washroom. She would not know if she would need to use um, the toilet or should she use the basin or even the shower. Sometime during her admission, she actually thought that she was dead. So she actually asked the doctor speaking to her at some point, Adakah saya sudah mati? Or am I dead? At that point, she said that she felt that she had no organs or her organs were kind of decaying inside her. And she actually felt detached from her upper limbs that, you know, she felt detached from her arms, her fingers. After that, she'd actually mention that she is not her real self and there's actually someone else out there who is really her. After that, just to inquire who she thought she was, we actually showed her um, her reflection in the mirror. She actually was unable to recognize her own face at that point. She has no history of increase in goal-directed activities no increased energy or symptoms of hypomania or mania, no history of URTI, UTI, no history of falls, accidents, or seizures in the past. Her first psychiatry contact with us was actually in 2015 when she was 35 years old. At that point, she was brought to the emergency department by her husband due to abnormal behavior, not too different from uh, her current presentation. So at that point, she had this abnormal behavior for a month which was soon 10 days prior to the hospital visit. At that point, 
she was talking irrelevantly where she was speaking about dosa or sins, pahala, jinn and shaitan. At that point, she was also having hallucinatory behaviour, talking and laughing to herself. She was wailing like a child, rolling on the floor, crying. And at that point, she had also a bit of delusional jealousy whereby she actually accused her husband of having an affair with someone else. She also experienced paranoia or persecutory delusion towards work colleagues and became withdrawn, communicated less even with her own husband. Her function deteriorated and she was unable to do chores, unable to work, un un unable to care for herself. Prior to that presentation, which was nine years ago, she had no seizure, falls or fever either. At that point in her first contact at the ED, she was noted to be disorientated, preoccupied and suspicious towards the doctors. City brain findings were normal at that time. However, her TSH was more than 100, which was extremely high, and her T4 was less than 5.15, which was low. Management on our side by the psychiatry team was to start olanzapine, subsequently switching to haloperidol, and tapered off during her clinic appointments. She was on antidepressants as well, due to her depressive symptoms that she was having, low mood, lethargy, occasional episodes of poor sleep, and reduced motivation to work, which she attributes to issues with work colleagues. She was never ever suicidal and had never engaged in self-harm. Endocrine management was to restart the levothyroxine um, as she was actually on thyroid medication. I'll get into her medical history later, yeah? So, she was diagnosed with hyperthyroidism in 2004 uh, in a different hospital. Her presentation that time, 20 years ago, was having fever, vomiting, weight loss, and hand tremors. There were no physical signs at that time to indicate Graves' disease. She went through um, radioactive iodine um, intake in 2008. After that, she subsequently developed hypothyroidism and was on levothyroxine since then. However, she had a period of three years from 2012 to 2015 where she actually totally defaulted follow-up and treatment, not on any medication and was not seeing any doctors. So she ended up having severe hypothyroidism in 2015, which led to a psychosis, as mentioned just now in her past psychiatric history. She's never had COVID-19 and has completed COVID-19 vaccinations, two Sinovac and one Pfizer booster dose. She had attained monarchy at age 13, had regular cycles most of the time. However, she was diagnosed with primary subfertility prior to conception of her first child in 2012. Gynecological investigations were normal and her child was eventually conceived spontaneously without any intervention. She has three children, um, born in 2012, 2016 and 2020. One of her children is diagnosed with autism and when she is well, she's actually able to care for her autistic child. She did not have any history of postpartum blues, postpartum depression, and or postpartum psychosis following any of her pregnancies. She was born full term by a spontaneous vaginal delivery. Her mother had no significant antenatal complications. She is the eighth child among nine siblings. Her developmental milestones were achieved within normal time frame. She's not had any illnesses or seizures during her childhood. In terms of her education, she's an average student, but she did mention that she had a bit of difficulty with mathematics and calculation throughout her schooling life and up till now. She has no other learning difficulties or disabilities such as dyslexia. She completed and passed out um, with SPM. Subsequently, she started working in a publishing company more of a clerk and administration job until recently where she, her role uh, extended to doing other things as well, such as printing. She has no family history of autoimmune disease. Um, her elder sister was recently diagnosed with thyroid disease a few months ago. No family history of mental illness. She does not um, smoke cigarettes, smoke vape, or engage in illicit drug use or alcohol consumption. Okay, so this is just a brief uh, summary uh, in the form of a timeline with regards to her symptoms. So hyperthyroidism in 2004, hypothyroidism in 2008, uh, severe 
hypothyroidism in 2015 with psychotic symptoms, completely well up to this year in 2024, where she presented with depressive symptoms, psychotic symptoms, and cognitive changes. In terms of her pre-morbid personality, she's known to be a soft-spoken, quiet person, introverted. She does not have many close friends, but she is a pleasant person in general, friendly, just shy. For her mental state examination on the 27th upon admission, she's a Malay lady, mid-40s, average build. She appeared confused and disorientated at that time. She was unsure of about where she was and who brought her. She was unable to sustain eye contact with any of the doctors, seemed to be smiling inappropriately to herself and talking to herself. She was unable to answer most of the questions during the interview, said she was unsure or tak tahu to most of the things she was asked. During admission, she appeared perplexed and grimacing most of the time during her daily reviews. She looked confused and fearful, um, but wearing her hosp hospital attire appropriately, she would require assistance from the nursing staff to actually help her uh, during the first few days of admission to get dressed. Her hygiene was fair, also assisted by nurses during the first few days of admission. She had good eye contact and fair rapport. Her speech was relevant and coherent. She had normal rate and tone, but some days she, it was of minimal amount as she did not feel like speaking or felt tired. Volume of her voice was usually low. Mood described to be low, and her effect was appearing to be scared, confused, and sad, which was congruent or appropriate to her thoughts at that time. So when we reviewed her, this is what we noted. She did have auditory hallucinations, delusion of reference, delusion of control, delusional mood, thought alienation in the form of thought insertion, withdrawal and broadcasting, finger agnosia, Cotard's delusion, which is that feeling of uh, being dead and that her organs are decaying, and a delusion of misidentification, whereby she felt that there was someone else who was her, but she is not herself. So a syndrome of subjective double. She was also noted to forget how to use her toothbrush and the washroom facilities, and that was the reason why the nursing staff actually had to help her um, on a daily basis. So nurse had to even help her help feed her during the first week of admission. We noted that during our reviews, sometimes you just see the toothbrush with the toothpaste still there on her bed. She had no self-harm ideation, no suicidality, no homicidality. She did have partial insight because she knew something was wrong with herself, which is why she always looked so perplexed and confused. These were her vital signs. Um, everything pretty normal, with exception of a mild raising temperature, 37.3 GCS4. Um, systemic examination, grossly normal, including the neurological examination. This is just a few of the investigations that we had done. I'll go through them now. With her blood investigations, um, on admission, her potassium was low, urea and creatinine high. Um, after um, appropriate management, it was corrected, subsequently improved. But we noted that her CRP and C4 was raised and it, she even had a positive ANA. Um, with regards to her thyroid investigation, um, initially during admission it was normal, but somehow a week later when um, there was uh, abnormalities in her CRP and C4, we noted that her TSH um, had reduced. Her white cell count was 11, hemoglobin 11.8, so uh, slightly abnormal. Everything else normal. We even took her antithyroid peroxidase and antithyroglobulin. Um, the figures there are within normal range, so it is negative. Neurological team, uh, neurology team actually reviewed patient and did um, lumbar puncture. With regards to the CSF uh, serum findings, um, the total protein was raised, everything else was normal. Unfortunately, due to financial reasons, um, we were not able to proceed with the anti-NMDAR um, serology for the patient. 
in terms of radiological investigations, we did do a CECT initially. The only abnormality noted um, was a soft tissue de density in the right epitympanium and the right mastoid cells. An MRI with contrast was done just about two weeks later, and the only abnormality was minimal fluid in the right mastoid cells, which corresponded with the previous CECT findings. So that's the CECT. Um, whatever's in the red box, that was the abnormality that was found. Um, there we can see that on one side, uh, it's more uh, whitish, I would say, very elementum um, in the epitympanium. The other side, you can see that there's more air cells through. This is the MRI, which appeared pretty much normal. We did a mocha for her um, on the 4th of June and uh, repeated it later on. Um, later, um, Dr. Salisa will be explaining more on the neuropsychological investigations. But essentially, her first mocha revealed that she had moderate cognitive impairment with a score of 14 out of 30 and actually improved to 22 out of 30 um, about a week later. Electrocardiogram or ECG was normal. Electroencephalogram or EEG was normal as well. Our diagnosis for her, um, two diagnoses actually, is a depressive disorder with psychotic features due to general medical condition, and in her case, hypothyroidism. So according to the DSM-5, depressive disorder due to another medical condition comprises of a few of the criterion. Uh, I'll try my best to get through it quickly in the interest of time, yeah? So essentially a prominent and persistent disturbance in mood that predominates in the clinical picture and is characterized by depressed mood or markedly diminished interest or pleasure in all almost activities. So this was present in the patient. Ashiro had always appeared depressed and even during clinic follow-ups, she somehow or other had low mood. That was her initial presentation as well. There is evidence from the history, physical examination, and laboratory findings that the disturbance is a direct pathophysiological consequence of another medical condition. So we could see from the lab investigations that her thyroid function was not normal at that point, and even autoimmune markers, which may or may not have been nonspecific, was also not normal. The disturbance is not better explained by another mental disorder, such as adjustment disorder or a stressor with a serious medical condition. The disturbance may not extensively occur during the course of delirium. And the disturbance causes clinics, clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning. She clearly had a decline in functioning, so definitely uh, fulfills that criteria. So after a thorough cross-examination of the timeline of patient symptomology, so it is evident that there is definitely a correlation between her depressive and psychotic symptoms and her thyroid function. It is pertinent to note that she always had a compliance issue with her thyroid medication, which actually may explain her depressive symptoms. She may not actually have uh, those physical symptoms that we characteristically see in hypothyroid patients, such as thinning of hair, um, increase in weight gain, cold intolerance. However, she did have that lethargy, fatigue most of the time, and low mood. So throughout the years in the psychiatry clinic, that's just uh, that baseline sort of low mood and lethargy. Also, she was admitted twice in the psychiatry ward, and this was only during the periods of time she had defaulted her levothyroxine medication for extended periods of time, as the intensity of depressive symptoms had worsened and there were prominent psychotic features, such as delusion, hallucination, disorganized behavior, and disorganized speech. And that's why she was rendered unmanageable. So, of course, unsurprisingly, during these times, her thyroid function was deranged. Our second diagnosis is delirium due to multiple etiologies, for her being acute renal failure, hypokalemia, and hypothyroidism, with a specifier of acute with mixed levels of activity. In delirium, a criteria... Um, the criteria would be a disturbance in attention, which is the reduced ability to direct, focus, sustain, and shift attention, accompanied by reduced awareness of the environment, which the patient had actually experienced as she was pretty much unaware of her surroundings when she had first came to us. 
The disturbance developed over a short period of time, usually hours to days, and represents a change of baseline attention and awareness, and may fluctuate in severity during the course of the day. So she does have these periods of time where she may or may not remember her family um, and to do certain things as well as recognizing her pain list. So it does fluctuate throughout the day and the days following admission as well. Um, she does have an additional disturbance in cognition in the form of memory deficit, um, disorientation, language, and visuospatial abnormality. So that is something uh, we had actually assessed via AMOCA, and she seems to have that as well. And for patient, the disturbances in criteria A and C are better, not better explained by another pre-existing, established, or evolving neurocognitive disorder and do not occur in the context of a severely reduced uh, level of arousal, such as a coma. So the patient fulfills all the criteria affirmation as she did have cognitive issues and inattention, which improved, uh, as I will explain later, uh, in her progress as the medical conditions uh, were resolved. So a challenge generally may arise in differentiating a psychotic episode and delirium, as the symptoms may actually overlap, such as behavioral changes and perceptual disturbances. However, do note that delusions and thought alienation, which the patient experiences, are not part of delirium psychopathology. So it actually may be appropriate to conclude that her depressive psychosis episode and delirium state were actually coexisting for several days, and uh, after which probably the delirium had resolved. Our differential diagnosis would be MDD with psychosis and schizoaffective disorder. Our management, um, when she was admitted to us, was to increase her acetylopram that she was already on to the maximum dose of 20 milligrams on night. We started her on olanzapine and was optimized to a dose of 20 milligrams on night, also the maximum dose. She was given clonazepam, 1 milligram on night of PRN. She did not require this that often. Um, we did give sort of a rescue dose of, uh, we planned for a rescue dose of haloperidol and midazolam. However, she did not require require it uh, throughout the few weeks of admission. She was referred to the endocrine team where we started her levothyroxine, 100 mcg OD and 125 mcg OD on uh, weekends. She was given a uh, slow K with uh, potassium levels repeated, IV hydration given, and of course, IO charting, vital signs monitored, behavioral charting, and of course, the relevant um, investigations as I had mentioned previously. And um, her progress was that her mood improved by the second week of admission, actually, by the time her acetylopram was optimized. The auditory hallucinations progressively reduced in intensity upon starting and optimizing the olanzapine um, and resolved actually three days prior to discharge. Her cognition improved objectively and patient was able to gain confidence engaging in self-care independently prior to discharge. Um, she was still a bit confused uh, when entering the bathroom, but she felt that it was a bit better than when she had first come into the ward. Delusions were gradually shakeable. She no longer believed that she was dead. She actually uh, touched her heart and said she's definitely alive as her heart is beating. She did not feel detached from her limbs and was able to recognize herself. Um, the thing that persisted was that she still had a feeling that people on the television were speaking about her, so she actually was not watching the television in the patient's lounge. Overall, patient had an improvement of 60%, and um, because the issues with cognition persisted despite the mood and psychotic systems being resolved. So she was discharged with an early appointment to review her progress and referred to the clinical psychologist for neuropsychological investigations, mainly because that although her psychotic and depressive symptoms were resolved, somehow the cognition uh, issues um, still persisted. So when I had seen her outpatient uh, after discharge, she was actually re able to uh, regain ability to do house chores, care for herself, care for her children, cooking uh, all over again. She was able to watch television programs with ease. Her mood has been well. Uh, her mood has been good, eating and sleeping well. And um, she would say that she was about 90% back to herself. Husband says that she's manageable, about 100% back to herself. Um, it was during this uh, follow-up uh, that she actually mentioned that she does miss her thyroid medication occasionally. And she actually knows that 
when she misses it for several days, she would be moody, self-isolate, and actually may hear auditory hallucinations. And once she restarted the medication, she'd be fine. Um, and her husband actually concurs with this as well. And uh, he actually was able to manage her during the previous uh, admission, like to put uh, adult uh, diapers and what to do because he was kind of used to managing her in the past. Mental state examination during her follow-up was pretty much normal, no issues. And we actually repeated her mocha as well. And it was actually 26 out of 30, so back to normal. So from 14 to 22, and then to, uh, 26, two weeks after discharge, when she was pretty much well. Thank you so much for listening. Okay. Okay, thank you, Shireen, for a very nice, clear presentation. Now, I won't um, allow for any questions at the moment. We will leave it at the end of this presentation. There's the time allocation for that. So, uh, Dr. Shalisa Sarit will talk about the neuropsychiatric assessment and its findings. So. Yeah. Okay, you can. Uh, thank you, Prof. Nick. Assalamualaikum and good morning to professors, doctors, colleagues and students. I will be talking about uh, neuropsychological assessment and its finding for Mrs. S. Neuropsychological assessment is an assessment of cognitive ability. It determines an individual current level of functioning, where it is also identified for individual strength and limitation, which aid rehabilitation and intervention. Based on this cognitive framework, uh, the assessment can be conducted either broad or generalized cognitive ability, meaning uh, bottom-up uh, function, or can also recently, a new evidence, we can also do uh, top-down uh, assessment. Or some, some clinician who prefer to do specific cognitive ability based on the refer. The choices of the assessment can be determined by the cognitive ability or based on the location, brain location. Okay, let's talk about Mrs. S. Neuropsychological Assessment. As Dr. Shirin has informed just now, she was referred for memory test with a chief complaint uh, from patients and husband regarding memory difficulty. Please be note that this assessment was conducted after she was one month discharged from the hospital. So we do not have a baseline functioning on the memory test except by MOCA. Uh, just a little bit information. If we conducted the assessment during this baseline period, patient was not stable and the validity of the uh, result will be question questionable. So the neuropsychological assessment begins with a screening test, MOCA, or known as Montreal Cognitive Ability. It is a screening tool used to determine the cognitive impairment is present and only takes about 10 minutes to complete. As Dr. Shirin has told us just now, we can see how the patient performance as overall, uh, significantly, there is improvement from 14, 22, and 26. However, the impairment in memory are maintained on all three cognitive assessments. And therefore, she was being referred to neuropsychological assessment. So, uh, only two core uh, memory tests was chosen. Uh, it is Penton Visual Retention Test, which assess visual perception and visual memory. 
In this test, patient was shown 10 design one at a time and asked to reproduce each one as possible on the plain paper from memory. Okay, you can see the result. Okay, so the scoring are based on the uh, uh, no, uh, correct score, number of correct score and number of error score. So she obtained 7 out of the expected uh, norms from 8 which indicate no impairment and the score of uh, uh, error score is still at the same normal range. So based on this test, no impairment on visual memory tests. I also conducted Ray auditory verbal learning test. Uh, this test used to assess verbal memory, severity of memory dysfunction, and track changes in memory function over time. So in this test, patients were asked to repeat uh, 15 words uh, five times, one at a time, and then were given an interference list and asked to recall back uh, on the interference list and after 20 minutes, the patient were asked to recall the, uh, the 15 words that they, she say, uh, say to her in five trial. So the result of this uh, shows that uh, her immediate memory are uh, 38, which the average is 37 from 8, which is normal. Her learning is, uh, is also in a normal range. She managed to uh, total recall uh, at the end of the 20 delay, uh, 13 out of 15. So she only missed two words. Uh, significantly, uh, uh, she also uh, 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 been distracted by uh, the, the interference uh, uh, word, but managed to maintain the same level as before. I also conducted information processing, which uh, conducted three making tests, which assess visual attention, task switching, and speed processing. It has two parts in which subject is instructed to connect a set of 25 dots as quickly as possible while maintaining accuracy. As shown as this result, uh, her speed of processing are within a normal range, except at uh, 3B, uh, she preservative uh, a little bit where she still remember to do the instruction same as uh, Task A. However, after being informed, she managed to complete out of 25. As a conclusion, uh, overall, her visual memory are intact, verbal memory also intact, processing speed are also normal, uh, mood also normal, as indicated by CT scan and MRI. However, I would like to suggest that her progress need to be repeat uh, at six months or one year just to ensure that her improvement are maintained and to see whether the cognitive reserve is still uh, ability for her to improve in, in the future and prevent any cognitive decline. With that, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chalisa. So with, uh, next is Dr. Lau Chi Kun. He'll talk on the hypothyroidism aspect of the management of this patient. Eh? Sorry, while um, trying to download the slide.
Sorry for the delay. Okay, dear uh, distinguished uh, professor, doctors, allied health and uh, medical students. So my name is uh, Dr. Lau. I'm from uh, Endocrine Unit. So uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the uh, psychiatry team for inviting us uh, Endocrine Unit to give our a little bit of perspective on uh, hypothyroid and how it affects uh, this uh, lady who suffers from uh, Cotta syndrome. So my talk will be divided into uh, these few points. First, I would like to uh, share again why is uh, hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis, then followed by what are the common causes of hypothyroidism and the common uh, treatment modalities. And thirdly will be the different patterns of uh, thyroid function tests and how thyroid and uh, neuropsychiatric uh, disease are uh, uh, affecting uh, uh, each other. So some of these uh, cartoons may uh, look familiar to you all. So for example, this one, any medical student can identify the signs? Louder? Yeah, so this is a uh, typical, uh, the term we call the thyroid eye disease in a Graves patient. And the one below, the one with sad looking face. What uh, disease is this? As you can see, the puffy face, dull looking, and there's loss of a lateral third of the eyebrow. Yeah, this is typical hypothyroid uh, patient. So, um, bear in mind our endocrine uh, organs and how the hormones are released uh, function through the important negative feedback mechanisms. And when we talk about uh, thyroid hormone, uh, production, it can divide it into two, three tier system. The hypothalamus will produce this uh, thyroid releasing hormone and this thyroid releasing hormone will act on our anterior pituitary, the thyroid trough cell to secrete the thyroid stimulating hormone, which will then activate our thyroid gland to produce uh, thyro uh, thyroxine and also the T3. And most of the time, uh, 80% of the T4 will be uh, uh, produced uh, and the remaining will be the T3. But the active hormones that act on the periphery organ will be the T3 hormones. So when we talk about hyperthyroid uh, and the common causes, we can divide into four uh, big groups. Number one is of course the activation of thyroid hormone synthesis and secretion leading to this uh, autonomous release of excessive thyroid hormone, meaning uh, production of the thyroid hormone has gone out of control and not regulated by these uh, negative feedback uh, mechanisms. And of course, the common causes will be grave disease, uh, toxic thyroid adenoma, or toxic multinodular goiter. And, and uh, in our clinical practice, uh, these three causes comprise almost uh, 80 to 90 percent of the hyperthyroid uh, population that we are managing. Then next will be the thyroid stores or preformed uh, hormones are passively released in excessive amount. So some of the causes will be, uh, for example, autoimmune causes, you know, Hashimoto's, infective causes, or the neoplastic causes. Then thirdly, exposure to extra thyroid sources of thyroid hormones uh, could be either endogenous or exogenous. So some of the causes will be uh, stroma ovaries, uh, people who took uh, over-the-counter supplements that uh, contain uh, thyroxines, or people who uh, consume an animal thyroid gland. And lastly, the thyroid gland is, can be excessively stimulated by trophic factors, for example, the thyroid stimulating horm uh, hormone and other factors, such as what we've seen in the pituitary secreting uh, 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 what we call the type uh, TSH secreting adenoma, uh, contrast media or uh, iodine contained drugs such as uh, amiodarone. 
And once we identify what are the common causes of this hyperthyroid, and if the cause is a grave disease, then usually the physician and the patient must choose between three effective and relatively safe uh, treatment options, uh, namely our antithyroid drugs such as uh, carbimazole or propylthyroid Next would be this uh, radioactive uh, iodine therapy, or lastly the th uh, total thyroidectomy. And the long-term quality of life following treatment for great disease was found to be the same uh, in whichever treatment option that the patient has uh, decided to choose. And how do we choose between the, these uh, three modalities? Actually, there are a lot of factors that involve, for example, uh, what's the age of the patient? If the patient is, for example, is a lady who are in a reproductive age, definitely the discussion need to be a little bit more uh, delicate and thorough. Uh, other instances, with, for example, whether the patients are allergic to antithyroid drugs, whether they have uh, uh, you know, liver impairment that uh, uh, prevents the, uh, us from starting an uh, antithyroid drug for them. Uh, for, uh, yeah. And other causes, you know, definitely some patients may not be able to prepare themselves for radioactive iodine because, uh, as I will uh, describe later, radioactive iodine uh, will need patients to uh, get ready and prepare for it. And thirdly, of course, whether uh, the patient has access to this uh, high volume of thyroid surgeon. And of course, the patient factor, they, they need to be fit enough to undergo uh, this uh, uh, surgery. So in a busy uh, thyroid clinic, so these are the, the, the parts and parcel of the discussion that we've uh, undergo with our patient. And when we talk about radioactive uh, iodine therapy, it's actually discovered uh, that in 1895, uh, iodine was uh, part of the constituent of our thyroid gland. And uh, 20 years later, it was demonstrated that our thyroid gland actually could take up this uh, iodine actively. And that's how scientists uh, discovered that they can uh, use a radioactive iodine to treat this uh, uh, hypothyroidism. And subsequently, uh, when with the introduction of uh, antithyroid drugs, uh, radioactive uh, therapy subsequently becomes uh, uh, less favorable. And usually, how do we prepare patients for radioactive iodine? First of all, uh, this will involve counseling. And uh, before we send a patient to our nuclear medicine colleague for radioactive uh, iodine, we definitely need to optimize the thyroid function and other medical conditions. Because uh, prior to this uh, radioactive iodine, patients need to stop the antithyroid drug for at least uh, two to three days prior and then to resume back the medicine three to seven days after II. The reason being, uh, we want the uh, active uh, the thyroid gland to be uh, readily able to take up the the radioactive uh, iodine. So, if let's say the patient is on uh, antithyroid drugs, the effectiveness of the thyroid gland to concentrate the radioactive iodine will not be that uh, efficient. And of course, we need to avoid those iodinated co uh, radio contrast or other uh, iodinated compound for at least four to six weeks prior to this uh, radioactive iodine. And also, we need to advise patients on a low, low uh, iodine diet for a week before II. And of course, uh, ladies who are, uh, are planning for pregnancy or lactating, they are not suitable for RAI. And for patients who are actively smoke and they have great disease, they need to be advised to quit smoking because smoking is a risk factor for worsening of a thyroid eye disease uh, after the RAI. And on the day of the procedure, usually the patient need to uh, kneel by mouth for at least four hours uh, before the procedure and one hour after the uh, RAI. Usually it's being done as an outpatient procedure and radioactive iodine can be delivered in liquid or capsule form. And after the procedure, uh, patients often need to undergo uh, what you call this uh, quarantine, almost like a patient would suffer from a COVID infection. Because the radiation uh, will persist in the body for about eight days. Therefore, to maintain the distance from others approximately about one meter and not to share the kitchen utensils. They need to have good toilet ethic. And uh, for ladies they, who are lactating, they need to stop uh, breastfeeding their child. And not to forget, uh, contraceptive advice need to be given to the patient. And they're not suitable to get pregnant for at least uh, six months. 
And common side effects of radioactive iodine would be a transient a hypothyroidism. Some patients may experience thyroid pain and swelling. And other common causes will be this cellulodenitis. And lastly, it will be this flare up of a grace of thermopathy. And like I mentioned, it's higher risk among active smokers. And long term care after the radioactive iodine, uh, our American Thyroid Association uh, guideline recommend a dose of uh, RAI uh, between 10 to 15 uh, mercury would be sufficient to cause hypothyroidism. Usually, one dose will be required, but of course, there are rare instances where a patient may need to undergo second or even uh, third course of uh, RAI. And 10 and 15 uh, mercury results in hypothyroid in 69% at one year and 75% at six months of treatment, respectively. Patients are required to be followed up, usually at a dedicated and quiet clinic after the treatment until they uh, became a hypothyroid. And they should be on a stable dose of tyrosine before we discharge them to, our, to their nearest uh, community clinic for lifelong follow-up. And ATA recommends to test their thyroid function for the first two months, then to continue every four to six weeks for six months or until hypothyroid develops and uh, stable level are reached with uh, thyroid hormone uh, treatment. Uh, this is, of course, uh, to catch that in time so that we can start the tyrosine therapy for the patient who have undergone the RAI because we know that hypothyroid carries uh, uh, impact on their quality of life and it can also uh, like for these instances, uh, affect uh, those uh, with uh, psychiatric disorders and also those who have uh, cardiovascular disease. Definitely, we don't want their thyroid function to uh, fluctuate. So, for uh, back to this case, uh, like Dr. Shireen has uh, summarized earlier, this is actually a 44 year old Malay lady with underlying uh, hypothyroid. Based on the description, likely it's a grave disease and she has underwent a radioactive iodine in 2004 at HKL. Subsequently, she presented with acute psychosis which required a hospitalization in 2015. And as you can see, uh, like the result I have uh, Dr. Shirin shared earlier, this patient has uh, overt hypothyroidism. Uh, what we meant was uh, DSH level that is uh, very high with a non-detectable uh, free tyroxine label. And furthermore, if you analyze the, the fluctuation of the thyroid function of this lady uh, throughout the years, uh, the red line will indicate the DSH uh, level and the blue line will indicate the free T4. So as you can see, when she first presented to a uh, psychiatry ward, uh, the TSH was uh, grossly uh, elevated. Then with subsequent uh, tyrosine uh, replacement hormone, you can see that uh, the, the TSH has uh, improved uh, dramatically. But of course, throughout the years from 2015 to uh, 2024, you can see sometimes the TSH uh, fluctuates uh, largely between uh, 0.5 to 20. But the T4 level, uh, you can see is rather uh, stable uh, throughout the years within the range. So. When we have this uh, historical result, it will be very helpful for us to, to decide uh, how the thyroid function evolves and whether there are any other uh, factors that affect the stability of this uh, thyroid uh, hormone. So commonly, uh, compliance is, a, is a first and foremost that we would like to uh, uh, explore whether patients are taking their medicine properly. Then uh, following that, once if let's say the compliance issue is, uh, has been uh, uh, established, we will go on and uh, look for other causes that may affect the thyroid hormone. For example, uh, things like uh, introduction of uh, other medicine that may affect the absorption of the thyroxine, such as uh, proton pump in inhibitors, calcium channel blockers. And of course, sometimes in the situation uh, we call as a non thyroid illness, it can cause fluctuations in the thyroid function as well, which we will then uh, repeat the thyroid function once patients are out of this uh, non thyroid illness, which in the past are commonly uh, known as this uh, sick uterine syndrome. And what I like to highlight is, of course, acute psych psychosis itself is also a form of uh, non thyroid illness that can affect the stability of a thyroid function. 
And of course, uh, I will also go on to highlight to you the reason why this patient is on a uh, different dose of uh, weekday and a weekend dosing of levothyroxine. Usually, we would uh, start patient on levothyroxine uh, either using a weight-based approach or an age-based approach. For elderly patients, generally, we will start them on a low-dose thyroxine of 25 to 50. But for those who are fit and uh, young, usually, we will start with a weight-based uh, uh, level thyroxine of uh, 1.6 mic per kilo. And usually, we don't encourage patients to uh, split the uh, tyrosine tablets as this may affect the total amount of tyrosine that they receive. And, um, and to, to share with the, you all, the, our common uh, formulary in our Malaysia of uh, uh, tyrosine tablet will consist of 25 uh, microgram, 50 microgram, and 100 microgram uh, respectively. That's how uh, we adjust this uh, uh, tyrosine dose accordingly. And uh, this chart uh, will be a very famous uh, chart that we uh, endocrine community will uh, adopt and approach our uh, patient with hyper and hypothyroidism. And the hexagonal chart in the middle one uh, will indicate, you can see the arrow uh, means this is an ill thyroid patient, right? TSH is uh, normal and the FD4, FD3 is normal as well. And if you move the, the chart up, TSH suppressed, uh, T4 and the T3 is elevated. Uh, what would this uh, indicate? Anyone can give a shout out? You have high T4, T3, but your TSH is suppressed. This would indicate hyperthyroid, right? Yeah. So if you move it down, uh, FT4, uh, T3 is low, but your TSH is uh, elevated. What does this indicate? Hypo, right? So you can see that the chart in the middle is uh, easiest to interpret and uh, majority can uh, give the answer correctly and, and uh, treat the patient. Of course, the one uh, next to the left and to the right will be more tricky and that's when you will involve your friendly endocrine colleagues. So do remember this pattern uh, because uh, the mechanism behind this will be uh, like the negative feedback that I've shared with you at the first slide. And of course, things can be very tricky if we were to look at the original chart uh, of this uh, diagram, which was uh, first uh, published by uh, Professor Mark Grinnell, which is a, pro a professor from Cambridge University, which also recently came to Malaysia and delivered some of the keynote uh, uh, talk about adrenal and thyroid uh, disorders. But what I would like you all to remember is, of course, the menu chart. Anything beside it, you can always refer to us to solve the mystery. So just to highlight again, the one at the down part, you see, uh, when the T4 and the T3 is uh, normal, but the DSH is elevated, uh, this is a situation we call, is, uh, it doesn't vary, right? Because if one goes up, another one must come down. But in this situation, if the T4, T3 is normal, but the TSH is high, usually we will suspect poor adherence to levothyroxine. Like for example, in this case, we have a historical result to back us up. Of course, there are some other uh, common things that we need to exclude would be uh, drug causes, assay interference, or non thyroid illness, which are in recovery phase. And of course, uh, if the let's say the T T four T three are elevated, but the T S H is either normal or elevated, this can also indicate uh, level tyrosine replacement therapy that uh, can be uh, happens in those who are poorly adherent to their treatment. Then again, uh, non uh, N T I the non thyroid illness again can be a contributing factor as well. So lastly, it comes to this uh, thyroid hormone effects on uh, cerebral tissue. Our cerebral tissue is actually what we call a thyroid hormone sensitive uh, 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 organs in our body. You can see there are many mechanisms that can evolve and it, it can be rather uh, complex. So screening for thyroid disease in patients presenting with a uh, first episode of psychosis or delirium is a routine practice in our modern days. And there are surveys which reveal that more than 5% of the attendees at the psychiatric consultation have some form of abnormality in their thyroid function. 
And before there were effective treatments for grave disease, teratoxicosis was associated with the development of this uh, Bechdel's uh, psychosis, which was first described in the 19th century. And on the other hand, the association of hypothyroid with psychiatric illness was also recognized in the 19th century, which was later described as a mixed edema madness by the Escher in 1949. But the rapid onset of uh, hypothyroidism uh, after IRI treatment is something uh, rather rare, and, but it has been uh, reported before in a few uh, case reports. Like for example, uh, Freeman in 2009 reported a lady, uh, a lady with, with underlying uh, papillary thyroid CA uh, who had partial thyroidectomy, developed uh, paranoid delusions a day after uh, RAI. But uh, the T4 level was not available, but TSH was report, but re reported to be mildly elevated. And the symptom improved uh, a week after uh, risperidone. So if we were to analyze this case, we would uh, not really uh, tie uh, her symptom to the uh, attribute to uh, RAI because the treatment was just been delivered uh, a day prior to the symptoms. Uh, and also uh, RAI treatment takes time to take its uh, effect. And further on, Catherine in 2013 has reported a lady, uh, 26 years old, with grave disease, positive uh, tract antibody, presented with two weeks of a psychosis, and the symptoms started three months uh, after RAI. You can see in this case, TSH is uh, very elevated at 38, and T4 was very low. And after symptoms started, uh, 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 the Treatment was uh, tyroxine and uh, risperidone, uh, lorazepam, and she improved gradually. And the most recent, now, recent one would be a case reported by Er from Singapore. Um, the case report did not really highlight uh, what's the etiology of the uh, hypothyroid, but we assume ladies, the most common cause is still a grave disease, and she has a negative uh, NTTPO. Again, presented with history of uh, auditory hallucination, delusion, and agitation. But surprisingly, these symptoms uh, started 14 years uh, after RAI. So we do, we do not know whether in between the, the years uh, of follow up with a GP, whether the patient had any uh, thyroid function test. But the T4 uh, was reported to be uh, non detected with a very high uh, TSH of uh, 45. And again, a week after started uh, thyroxine replacement with antipsychotic. Uh, symptoms uh, resolve. So this charges to highlight that hypothyroid and mood disorder, the symptom can overlap and often you will need a, a proper history taking physical examination followed by a laboratory result to help you to decide which would be a more likely cause, whether it's hypothyroid alone or mood disorder alone or things that causes uh, together. And uh, on the other hand, both hypothyroid and hypothyroid are also common causes of uh, lithium treatment, which uh, our psychiatric colleagues sometimes use to treat bipolar affective uh, disorder. And not forgetting, there are even rarer causes such as uh, Hashimoto's uh, encephalopathy. And treatment with level tyrosine uh, usually will improve the neuropsychiatric symptoms and also their cognitive uh, functions, although the pattern can be uh, quite ins inconsistent. Often you will uh, hear patients complaining that despite their thyroid function has normalized, some of them still having uh, unexplained symptoms and of course there are other factors that, that, that can be involved. And uh, the chart uh, on the right just to uh, illustrate how the thyroid replacement therapy are evolved uh, over the years from using uh, animal extracts. Uh, subsequently we have developed this uh, uh, oral medication which uh, comes in tablets or liquid forms, and now we even have these uh, soft gel uh, capsules of uh, tyrosine replacement. So uh, in short, uh, the learning point I would like to share with uh, you guys will be psychosis can occur as a significant or presenting feature in both uh, undertreated thyrotoxicosis and hypothyroidism. And patient needs to be followed up accordingly after RAI therapy so that tyrosine replacement therapy can be initiated timely to uh, avoid compromising their quality of life. And lastly, a uh, psychiatric review to determine whether uh, temporary treatment with uh, antipsychotic is indicated in the individual cases. We like, uh, thank you all for your kind attention.
Thank you, Dr. Lau. I must say that this is a very good revision for us in psychiatry. Huh? Um, okay, last but definitely not the least is Professor Matia Datin Sri, Dr. Surat Muhammad Saini to um, have an overall uh, discussion of this case. Yeah? Please welcome Datin Sri Surat. Thank you, Prof. Nik Rozaini. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. And good morning to our esteemed professors, colleagues, uh, allied health and students. I'm going to discuss uh, this case. For those who just came, I just want to summarize uh, the case for you. Uh, this is a middle-aged lady for about 44 years old. She presented with uh, an acute abnormal behavior for about two weeks and upon assessment uh, we noted that she had a symptom of delirium with fluctuation in consciousness as well as a very florid psychotic symptom which include auditory hallucination, contact syndrome, syndrome of subjective double, delusion of control, delusion of reference, thought insertion and thought withdrawal which is not typical of the psychosis in delirium. Usually, the uh, psychosis in delirium uh, mainly is the perception uh, in which a patient uh, uh, presented with visual hallucination. On top of that, uh, the patient also has a sub syndrome or symptom of depression for quite some time. And also, uh, she had a history of psychosis due to severe hypothyroidism in 2015 with a history of uh, RAI in 2008. Uh, due to query grave disease. And uh, the symptom in 2015 only lasted for about one month. Okay, when we saw this case, uh, we think this is case is more suggestive of organic cause because of the atypical presentation, mainly because of the acute onset of the psychiatric symptoms, uh, late age of onset. The first uh, presentation was in uh, when the patient was 35 years old. And the recent one, uh, she was uh, uh, 44 years old. And there's an absence of personal or familial history of psychiatric disorder. And there's a history of psychosis uh, after the few years uh, of RAI in the past. And there is a poor treatment adherent to the levothyroxine treatment. And rapid response of the symptom with re-administration of levothyroxine or meaning that all these uh, florid symptoms diminish uh, only uh, about a week after we start restart the levothyroxine. Uh, this is uh, the diagnostic algorithm that uh, we use to rule out the organic disease. Uh, so basically, we, ad uh, we adapt the algorithm from Sternia et al. 2018. And as we can see here, this case is not a first diagnosis. And there is an indication of the past organic medical condition, and uh, therefore she need a further organic diagnostic workout. And we did a quite comprehensive uh, investigation, uh, as recommended by endocrine and also our neuromedical uh, colleagues. And uh, as we can see, uh, she had a slightly elevated. Uh, uh, thyroid symmetry hormone and also uh, 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 FT4 is a normal which indicate that she has a subclinical hypothyroidism on admission. Okay, the prevalence of a hypothyroidism post RI has been reported, and uh, as uh, we can see, there's a steep increase uh, after the first year with about a twenty-four percent. And 59% uh, of patients become hypothyroid after 10 years and 85% after 25 years. Uh, thyroid hormone is a very important hormone for our body and uh, it, it regulates uh, various psychological process 
during the development uh, of the nervous system, especially in the first trimester, the fetal nervous system needs thyroid hormone, which comes from the mother until the fetal thyroid matches and can make enough of its own. And it also helps the nervous system uh, develop by taking part in the growth of movement of neurons, the differentiation of neurons and glial cells, and the creation of a new connection between the neurons. Basically, it is important for the neurogenesis uh, synaptic formations. An adequate level of thyroid hormone are necessary for maintaining cognitive function, mood, and mental health. Okay, on uh, as uh, I mentioned before, uh, during the presentation, a patient presented with the delirium, uh, and she has almost all of these symptoms. Delirium in hypothyroidism, uh, in the context of hypothyroidism, it can present with acute confusion. Disorientation, memory disturbance, hallucination, agitation, and altered level of consciousness. However, in the extreme case, we call it as myxenema coma, in which uh, apart from the delirium, the patient also has a life-threatening condition, which characterized by severe hypothyroidism, hypothermia, altered mental state, status, and delirium. And uh, this uh, requires a medical emergency. And these are uh, basically a neuropsychiatric uh, symptom uh, presented in hypothyroidism. The common one is a cognitive impairment, which count about 50% of uh, the case. A patient can come with a cognitive impairment, lack of concentration, memory deficit, and also psychomotor slowing, which can be sometimes confused with the depression. For the depression, it accounts for about 40% of the patient. And uh, for the, for, uh, psychosis is less, uh, which, is, which is about 5 to 15%. And they can be, can be presented with a bizarre behavior, delusion, and hallucination. The amount of cognitive impairment in people with hypothyroidism is uh, time and also dose dependent. And uh, studies have confirmed that a lack of thyroid hormone in the brain microenvironment can cause uh, reduced monoamines like epinephrine and norepinephrine, and also it increased the GABA. Uh, as we know, the GABA is the accessory neurotransmitter in our brain. And also the metabolite of the thyroid hormone, like uh, three iodothyroxine, also can be affected. So it, uh, it prevents the, the thyroid hormone to cross the blood-brain barrier. Meanwhile, for the depression, Hypothyroid can cause depression and it correlates with the severity of depression. As uh, reviewed by Karakat Solis, uh, the thyroid hormone affects depression through several mechanisms. Uh, the TSH act through the thyroid hormone uh, isoform, the alpha and beta isoform. Both isoforms are expressed in the limbic system and play an important role in the mood regulation. And also, it can also modulate the brain serotonergic system. The GABA and hippocampal brain uh, derive neurotrophic factor, which further affecting the depression. Okay, in the meta-analysis, uh, on the 103, 375 subject from seven, seven studies, studies, it shows that the person with a subclinical, hypothyroid, hy, subclinical hypothyroidism can have significant elevated risk of depression than a person with euthyroid with the odd ratio of 1.78. So it means that uh, the patient can have a depression two times than those uh, with euthyroidism. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I'm, discuss, I'm discussing on the psychosis in hypothyroidism. Psychosis was first described as a possible complication of hypothyroidism in 1988 by the Community of Clinical Society of London. Uh, it, uh, the term is myxenema madness, and uh, it uh, was coined by the Richard Usher. Richard Usher is an endocrinologist, yeah? a British endocrinologist. In a review study of uh, 75 myxenema psychosis cases, uh, the diagnosis uh, is about uh, 42 years old 
which are roughly about the same age uh, as our patient. And dilution can occur in 91% of the cases with, with predominant of persecutory idea. Hallucination occur in 78% with auditory hallucination being the most prevalent. And manic symptom accompany psychosis more than depressive symptom with 52% uh, and 36% respectively. And physical symptom and sign of hypothyroidism were absent in 37% and 26% of the cases. Right. Uh, to date, uh, for the myxedema psychosis in subclinical hypothyroidism, only one case report has been reported, which suggests that although it is possible to develop psychosis symptom due to subclinical hypothyroidism, it is more common in overt clinical hypothyroidism. And the, um, in, uh, this is a study on the, uh, young Chinese adult uh, community study uh, with first episode and untreated major depressive disorder. They found that the prevalent preven rate of subclinical hypothyroidism is 56% in young uh, patients with uh, MDD and a higher proportion of MDD patients with subclinical hypothyroidism display psychotic features. Uh, which is about 14.3% uh, uh, versus 5.3% uh, with the odd ratio is about uh, 29 And the uh, thyroid stimulating hormone is a risk factor for psychotic symptom in MDD patient with subclinical hypothyroid. And the regression analysis showed that thyroid stimulating hormone is independently associated with PANS positive score. I want to talk about the Cotard syndrome. Uh, this is the uh, fascinating... Um, psychiatric phenomena is, is also called as the walking corpse or walking dead syndrome. Uh, it's a rare and severe psychiatric disorder where the individual believe that they are dead, do not exist, are putrefying or have lost their blood or internal organ. It is named after the French neurologist uh, Jules Cotard who first described the condition in the late 19th century. And the key features of the Cotard syndrome are nihilistic delusion, in which the individual with Cotard syndrome believe they are dead, immortal, or do not exist. There's an altered self awareness. Uh, the patient experiences a profound disconnect from their sense of self and identity, and there's an emotional detachment. Uh, they often exhibit flat or depressed effect, as if they have lost the will to, to live. And the cause, co causes of Cotard syndrome are uh, varies uh, most common in organic uh, due to organic factors like uh, neurodegenerative metabolic or traumatic brain injury uh, stroke brain tumor epilepsy multiple sclerosis brain infection for psychiatric uh, condition is uh, mainly the uh, is in severe depression and psychosis and also it can be found in the bipolar disorder and it can be due to medication side effect the cause of contact, I mean, the contact syndrome has been reported in someone on steroid, uh, anti epileptic, such as uh, levotiracetam, and also uh, dopamine medication, such as amantadine. Uh, okay, uh, this is, uh, I just want to talk about the syndrome of subjective double uh, as, uh, as uh, presented by our patient. This is a rare delusional misidentification syndrome. A person experience a delusion that they have a double or doppelganger with the same appearance but usually with different characteristics, leading a life of its own. It can be sensed or perceived but not necessarily seen. But uh, the syndrome of subjective double, if it's uh, seen, uh, we, it uh, possible is, is, uh, it is an autoscopic hallucination, which is part of the visual hallucination. Another type of subjective double is the experience of out-of-body out experience, uh, which is the, also we call as depersonalization, which uh, often occur in uh, someone in extreme stress. This disorder was first defined in 1978 by a great psychiatrist, George uh, Christodoulou, and he's also the one who um, find, I mean, uh, explain the four uh, delusion of misidentification, uh, which are the Capgras syndrome. Capgras syndrome is a person believe that a close family member, friend, or pet has been replaced by an identical imposter. 
for the uh, Frigoli syndrome, a person believe that a stranger or acquaintance is someone you know is in disguise. And in term of a, uh, a person believe that people in their environment have exchanged identity with each other while retaining their original appearance. The mechanism of this dilution of misidentification is thought is due to the uh, disturbance of the neural pathway that connected to the face recognition. And the um, the cotard and also the dilution of uh, misidentification shed uh, the same neurological roots uh, in which uh, they evolved the limbic system, a temporal parietal junction, and also parietal lobe. In the case of hypothyroidism, basically hypothyroidism, hypothyroidism globally decreased the cerebral me uh, metabolism, which interfered with the neural pathway. For the psychodynamic uh, perspective of the Kotak syndrome, uh, it is often seen in severe depression where the patient's self-worth self is profoundly diminished. The delusion is of being dead or non-existent can be interpreted as an extreme form of self-negation and self-punishment. Uh, it involves the ego di the dissolution. The belief in one non-existent could reflect a collapse of the narcissistic defense that normally support a coherent sense of self, the individual ego might be overwhelmed by feeling of worthless and insignificant. The defense mechanism that uh, the patient may use is a denial and also splitting. For the syndrome of subjective double, uh, it can be derived from the unconscious uh, conflict, uh, which manifests as the proje projection of an unwanted, unacceptable part of the self into the perceived double. And the mechanism that uh, defend that they use is uh, also splitting and also projection, which uh, can lead to the creation of the double to manage internal psychological conflict. Even though it uh, in this case uh, is uh, more likely to be um, organic, however, in some patients, the presentation of uh, their psychotic symptom can represent their internal conflict. Other interesting feature of this case relate to the fact that the patient did not present with physical symptoms or signs of hypothyroidism, which may happen in almost 40% and 30% of cases. For the management of this patient, uh, for the acute management, so basically as mentioned by uh, Dr. Sherin, uh, uh, we treat the delirium with uh, and uh, we treat the cause of delirium. Uh, in which in this patient, we noted that uh, delirium might be caused by the acute renal impairment and hypokalemia. And, uh, and we treat them with the uh, IV fluid and uh, slow K. And she was referred to endocrine team for assessment and treatment of her underlying hypothyroid. And uh, the endocrine team started her with levothyroxine. And antidepressants uh, such as acetylopram and antipsychotics such as olanzapine were also prescribed for her for her depressive and psychotic symptom. And the endocrine or medical clinical psychologist were the multidisciplinary team that co manage uh, the patient during admission. This is a pharmacological management for the non pharmacological management for the delirium. Uh, basically, we focus uh, on the environment, to ensure a calm, wet, lit, and quiet environment to minimize sensory overload, reorient the patient, uh, promote a sleep uh, hygiene ensure hydration and nutrition, and encourage the mobilization. For long-term management, um, uh, due to her latest MOCA score was uh, 26 over 30, which was done last week, which indicate mild cognitive impairment. So she was referred to neuropsychologist for further assessment um, for the indication of rehabilitation. If, uh, I mean, if there is uh, any indication for the connective uh, rehabilitation therapy. And uh, optimization of levothyroxine to normalize the hormone level with regular endocrine follow-up is essential. The psychoeducation on treatment adherence was given to her. And uh, also, we, I mean, uh, as a team, we give a supportive uh, psychotherapy. And we may refer for CPT if a uh, mood symptom recur. Because uh, she has also... Uh, ongoing conflict issue with her, her workmates. Yeah? Okay, so uh, last slide. 
uh, for prognosis with appropriate treatment, the prognosis for neuropsychiatric related hypothyroid symptom is good. Most patients experience significant improvement in the symptom once your thyroid status is achieved and close monitoring is essential to ensure complete resolution and to prevent recurrence. With that, uh, okay, uh, this is the highlight of the case uh, already mentioned also by Dr. Lo. So with that, I thank you. Thank you, Prof. Datin Suryati for a very comprehensive discussion of the case. So because of the time, I can perhaps allow one question only if there is any burning question from the audience or comment. Okay, if, uh, if there is no question, we thank uh, Datin and her team, as well as Dr. Lau Chikun for um, discussing this case very comprehensively and tying together the biopsychological and social aspect of the management of this case. Yeah? Um, there is a Kahoot quiz for the medical students. Yeah? Okay, so otherwise uh, we conclude the case with this. Thank you so much. <laughs>